while uh, the last people are getting uh, finding a seat somewhere, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Joanne Britton, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to our next course that we are starting this morning for the next four weeks. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to remind you to turn on your T-coils, and please turn off your cell phones and put them away for the duration of the class. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. J.R. Paulson, a local physician that I'm sure everybody knows that he's here to talk to us about mental health today. Please welcome Dr. Paulson. Okay, thank you all for being here. Can you hear me in the back, Jan or Fergie? Is this okay? Not too loud? Okay, great. Well, I want to start this uh, course out with uh, a couple questions for you. First one, I want to spend a couple minutes and just from the audience, just raise your hands. I'll repeat the question. What questions would you like to have answered at the end of this class? What do you want to know or what do you want to find out that will have made this worthwhile? So don't be shy. Pop up a hand. Dan. Uh, since this is supposed to be a new approach to mental illness, uh, mental illness, the word itself is so negative connotation. I was wondering, is there any workings of having the name replaced with mental health issues or mental health problems? Because you, if you have a broken leg, you don't say this person has a, a leg illness. Because we don't. Okay, Dan's question is uh, basically rephrase it is the stigmata of mental health and the negativity that goes along with that. If you talk about your heart disease, not a problem, but if you mental health, it's pejorative and uh, takes you down a different way. Good question. I'll pop up with some more. Now that a bipartisan effort in the Iowa House and Senate uh, concerning furnishing adequate resources um, and will be signed by our governor if she uh, decides to do that soon. How can we be motivated to get funding? Okay, the question is there's some movement in the Iowa House legislature-wise to get some public funding with a bill and this question is how do we get funding? So and the fourth... It's bipartisan. And it's bipartisan. So the fourth class, I'm going to talk about specifically what things we can do in Grinnell here and in the state. Right. Right. Makes sense? So, yeah. yeah. How about the relationship between stress and mental illness? How does stress? Question, and what's the relationship between stress and mental health? Any other burning questions? Hereditary. Hereditary. How much of mental health or mental illness is hereditary? Yes, sir. Is there any correlation between different occupations and mental health? Good question. Occupations in correlation in good or bad mental health. <coughs> correlation between mental health and drug abuse. Correlation between mental health and drug abuse. We're going to spend a lot of time in that. In class three, I'm going to do a big chunk on that. Well, let me, yeah, one more in the back. Why is Finland so happy? <laughs> Question, why is Finland so happy? I'll tell you why, but I'll tell you why another country is happier. But you've got to wait for class four for that. Okay, so next five minutes, I want to get you get some buy-in in this class. And then we'll get rolling. So what I want to know from you, and again, just pop them up because I'm just going to spend five minutes doing this. What, how do you know if you see a person or hear a person around, if they're normal or they're not? If they have mental illness or they don't? Or if they're crazy and should be locked up or not? How do, how do you, how do we decide what's, sane and what's not sane. So just pop anything out. Mood swings. Pardon? Extreme mood swings. Mood swings.
Okay, just throw these out. How well they handle daily chores? <coughs> daily activities. Handle daily chores. Antisocial. Antisocial. So you think someone's, well, we'll get into that further. Keep going. Just throw them out. Hearing messages when there's really no one around. Hmm. <laughs> voices. Hearing voices. Hearing voices. Uh, auditory hallucinations. Yeah. <laughs> now, we call them auditory if you hear them, and visual if you see them. So if somebody's seeing stuff that ain't there or hearing stuff that's not really there, they might have a problem, right? How about the success of treatment? Pardon? The success of treatment. Success of treatment. Well, we got to decide if they're crazy first. So let me <laughs> paraphrase your question, Sally. Who needs treatment? Okay, I mean, before you decide treat, okay. who, who's... Who's... Eating treatment. And who decides that? And we're going to find out that's a very, very, very important question. Suicide. So I would assume you're, if you're ready for suicide, uh, your suicidal thoughts or things that is not good for mental health, right? Aggressive behavior toward others. Aggressive behavior toward people and <coughs> you know why in the back. Har harming yourself, like cutting. Self harm, cutting, good. like a good start. I just wanted to see where you're uh, coming from. <laughs> okay, so what we need to do and have is an approach toward this. It's very complicated and that's why I want to try to break it down for you. So mental health is really talking about mental illness. And we'll go into that. So what do you want to learn? We just went over that. Class one, I want to define what we mean by mental illness and understand the models and paradigms used over the past several hundred years. <coughs> understand the psychodynamic and diagnostic models and how each has evolved. Become familiar with the DSM nomenclature and its assumptions of mental disorders, especially the paradigm shift presented in DSM-3. Class two, you'll find out in the next week. <laughs> uh, this will come up again and again. If you take notes, you can copy it. Um, this is the paradigm I used in the other classes on uh, history of medicine and mental illness. And I'm going to come back. This is my a paradigm that I found that I use. I'm going to use it throughout this whole class. So we've got the healthcare professional, the patient, and the disease, and it's all encircled in a medical system and a social cultural system. 
and I hope to show you today how this model is used or not used. So we can also recognize this picture by Eduard Munch called The Scream. So who's crazy and who's not? Like this guy's, maybe? Maybe, maybe not. How many recognize that one? Here's Johnny. Oh, there's Johnny again. He looks pretty good. Different time, different place. This is Johnny a little bit later in that episode. Doesn't look too good, does he? Did you say he's mentally ill now? How about this guy? Is he really mentally ill, or is he just kind of like telling you what to do with it and antisocial? I like this quote by Depp. Crazy people don't know they are crazy. I know I'm crazy. Therefore, I'm not crazy. Isn't that crazy? It's pretty good. There's some truth in that. And Einstein, I love this one. The thing about smart people is they sound like crazy people to stupid people. Oh. Can you tell by looking at someone? What about looking at this guy? He might have some problems. What about art? Someone draws this picture. What are they, what's the underlying theme they're saying? I read it as they're drowning. Does this woman, she obviously has a physical problem since she weighs over 700 pounds, but does she have a mental health issue? Or what about this one? Does she have a mental health problem or disease or issue? We'll find out and we'll talk about both of them in the class. What about this teenager? Problem today with a tremendous epidemic in drugs and narcotics. Got a mental problem or is it just a substance abuse problem? What about this guy? Has he got a mental health issue or problem? How about the behavior of these two folks? Is that a mental health problem? Is that an issue? Is that a disease? What about these guys? Do they have a problem? Well, we'll have to get in and decide if they do. Well, we don't do too well in this country. According to the survey of 14 countries, the United States says the highest rate of mental illness shows other countries where we are, other, now we'll get into demographics of reporting and everything, but I'll, I'll go into a lot more detail on this. So we're not doing too well. Deaths per million people due to mental and behavioral disorders. This could include gun violence, by the way. And look at the reds. And notice South Africa, the United States, Greenland, and Russia coming pretty high on that. Okay, so for this class, I thought I'd get out my medical dictionary. Stedman's medical dictionary. Remember, you wanted to find something, you go to the dictionary. And it's got two categories here. One, mental illness. Disease of the brain. B, a disease of the mind or personality by, by abnormal behavior. Three, disorder of conduct, evidenced by socially deviant behavior. So, you can look at those three categories, the disease of the brain, or the mild, mind, what are you thinking, or the way you're acting. Or two, any psychiatric illness listed in the standard nomenclature of diseases of the American Medical Association, or DSM. And we're gonna spend a little time later today, and you're gonna know about that manual. So, you can go to the Bible, which I have here, DSM-5, want to know it's crazy? Or got a mental illness, it's in here, and we can tell you all about that. Or, you can do one of those things. They're not mutually exclusive. So, mental health can be also, causes a person to have an altered mood, we already talked about mood, pattern of thinking, crazy thinking, non-rational thinking, Oral behaviors, they're acting really screwy. And who decides what that means? Throughout history, there have been three general categories of the causes of mental illness. 
So we're going to get into the cause of supernatural, somatogenic, which means it comes from the body or is an illness, and psychogenic, it comes from what you're thinking. So let's try to categorize the cause of mental illnesses into those things. Supernatural, coming from the body, and coming from the mind, what you're thinking. The star is for notes. Those are things that will be on the test. <laughs> so that means important. Remember that. Briefly, Thomas Kuhn talked, wrote a book. He inspired me when I was in college, uh, reading his book, Scientific Revolutions. He says, progress in science happens through revolutions. He wrote this famous book. Anybody familiar with this? Yeah. Anybody in science should be. Very powerful book. And so what happens is you have this pre-science, and then we get scientific about it, and then you have a model. But then the model starts to change a little bit as different things happen. Then there's a crisis in the model. Then there's a revolution. Then there's a paradigm change. That's called the Kuhn cycle. And he coined the word paradigm shift, by the way. Stephen Covey, who I also admire, gave him uh, credit for that. Classic example, Earth-centered universe, Copernican revolution, paradigm shift, right? Later, conflict, Newtonian physics, doesn't describe the world the way it really is. There's problems with the planets. Enter Einstein, paradigm shift. Special relativity, general relativity, different paradigm. Quantum physics, so we have these different paradigms in science and in physics. Well, we have paradigms in medicine too, whether people or doctors are aware of it is another thing. So let's go through a very brief history of mental illness. I did this in some of my other classes. Let's go back to Hippocrates, about 400 BC. And he's the first one that separated superstition and religion. Remember, it had been the gods or you were cursed by people. He said, no, 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 it's, it's a problem with your body. And he came up with the four humors, the blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm, and so bloodletting, different things, but the origin of the disease is these imbalance of humors, particularly melancholia, or black bile. So his humorism was called somatogenic, means it comes from the body. That's why you screwed up, that's why you have the illnesses. Middle Ages, Christian Europe. Mixture, they couldn't, because it's Christian Europe, there's still a lot of uh, magic and divine. But they still used four humors, even that much later. They did trepanning, which we're going to talk about, as a cure to let demons and excess humors out of the body. But also, I underline this, madness was sometimes also seen as a moral issue. And I'm going to come back to uh, class four and five and talk about the morality. Uh, you say, what's the morality of mental illness? There's no morals there. Yes, there is. And lastly, care of the mentally ill was the responsibility of the family. So you had something crazy in your family, you just locked them up in the basement of the dungeon, you didn't get them out. That was your problem. Uh, here's a woman who's obviously got some problems. She's getting stretched out on a rack, they're trying to force feed or something, and someone's uh, reading from a, a treatise, uh, probably invoking some higher call. How many are familiar with this book? <coughs> Malleus Maleficarum. Anybody? Raise your hand. It's called The Hammer of Witches. It was published in 1487 in Europe. And it talks about so heinous of the crime of witches that they need to burn. So we have to find witches and burn them. Now, if you were living back then, the number one published book during this time was the Bible. Number two on the bestseller list for 200 years was this book. Number two for 200 years. So everybody almost had this along with their Bible. So, Trephining, this is a famous uh, painting by Bosch. I love this picture's extraction of the stone of madness. And there's a lot of uh, uh, satire in here with the people. This is 1500. Oh, you put a hole in their head. What do you think about that? Is that kind of a good idea? I mean, you got problems, why not let them out? I mean, your model is you got stuff in there that's not doing well, let it out. Whether it's humors or stone or whatever, right? I love Bosch's other works. I'd like to get into his mind. Any of you that have looked at his stuff, 
it's this is just <laughs> you can spend a lot of time looking for symbolism in his things. I just his mind must be pretty miraculous. Gee, I have this in my office. Some of you have seen it. Truffening in ancient Peru. So not in Europe, but in Peru, they're doing the same thing. They're putting holes in people's heads to let stuff out. When did it start? Here's a skull, 6,500 before the Common Era. Think about that. They know that these are done with flints. They're putting holes in heads. So you didn't have some religious or other reason. This has been going on a long time. Modern period. It's called modern 16th to 18th centuries. People were admitted to workhouses, poor houses, in jail. So one of the things that people didn't work, they didn't want to work, they put you in the poor house. <coughs> End of the 17th century, started to be seen as an organic phenomena, no longer involving the soul. New terminology. This is the age of enlightenment, quote. Bedlam Hospital was formed as a place to take care of England, Mary of St. Bethlehem, or St. Mary of Bethlehem, 1730. This huge hospital in England to take care of all the insane people. Pretty impressive place. More art. Anyone familiar with this picture? Progress of the Rake, or it's called the Rake's Progress. And it's one of a panel, and you see the crazy person down here, Thomas Rakewell, and he went through mental deterioration over the years, and there are paintings that show this. He was very, uh, he was the son of a very rich, uh, miserly father, and he inherited all the money, and he went downhill fast. And debauchery, and gambling, into the poorhouse, and finally in the insane asylum. So that's Rakewell. Notice these women here. Wait, they don't fit. These are like crazy people. They admitted people, you can have a fee and go to Bethlehem and look at all the crazy people on a Sunday afternoon. So they made a little money on the side. Other pictures, you can, I think, just look at these people. And if you're an astute physician, you can almost call what type of disease that they have. Treatment was not very good. Spinning them, putting them in. Philip Pinnell. Taking the chains off these people. Famous uh, painting in uh, uh, in Saint Asylum in France. Again, in, during the Enlightenment. Ben Gunther put me onto this public hospital, first one in North America. Williamsburg, first patient, 1773. Public hospital for persons of the insane and disordered minds. So you don't have them around. You got a place for them. My theories of that time, there were diseases of the brain and the mental uh, and nervous system, but mentally ill also often chose to be irrational. Not all of them, but they chose. So you got to change your behavior. They didn't choose this. So Benjamin Rush was the father of American psychiatry. He treated the mentally at Pennsylvania Hospital. He saw madness as a disease. He says he used talk therapy, humane treatment, holistic approach. I don't know who's trying to promote this slide, but I'm not too impressed. Because he used some of these devices. He's the one that has the spinning chair. And that's his device up in the corner there. Put people in this. Or in the cribs. You'd spin them at high speeds. The tranquilizer chair. Rush also felt that frightening the patient with beneficial. Some subjects were told repeatedly of their impending death and then placed in a cas casket with holes that was submerged in water for several minutes. Rush's favorite treatment was bleeding. He felt many dis mental disorders were caused by a buildup of blood in the brain. So that's the father of American psychiatry. He also had this interesting attitude toward blacks. He said, blacks are black, they've got this disease. Negroes are suffering from an affliction called negritude, which was thought to be a form of leprosy. And the only cure for the disorder was to become white. <laughs> Dorothea Dix, she's one of, she's a hero, she's amazing. She was a school teacher who got tuberculosis. And uh, so she went, 
She couldn't teach any longer, so she went into jails to teach Sunday school. And uh, so when she visited in Boston, East Cambridge Jail, she saw these mental patients living alongside with all the criminals in cold, filthy cells. She was outraged at the conditions and voiced her concern for the mental patients. The jailer responded by saying that the lunatics couldn't feel the cold. And Dorothea Dix went on to be an unbelievable advocate. First thing, she got heat in the jail. She went to the legislature. So John talked about political activism. She went to all this, the state legislatures and said, we need to build hospitals for these people. The same where they were just in jails. You know, that's where the mental people were. In class four, you're going to find out deja vu. Things are like that again. So, not only she formed in different states around the United States, 32 mental hospitals. 15 schools for the feeble-minded, established libraries and prisons for you library folks. Not only in the United States, she went around Europe, she went to Scotland, she went to England, on the continent, said, you guys are treating your mentally people horrible, you just got them in jail, you got to build places for them to take care of them. And one of the largest ones is in Raleigh, North Carolina, a block from my son's house, Dix Hill Asylum. Built in 1856. Pretty big place. It grew to. Because there's a lot of people that need it. When I was there last time, Sean and I walked around the cemetery and looked at the, take the grass off and kind of try to read the inscriptions of some of the people that lived there and died there. If you're well off, you could do pretty, pretty well. You could get a fancy place, spend some money, and hang out with some other people that uh, need some help. But the majority were packed into uh, asylums in smaller living places. I was able to go and look at the admissions at that time. So Massachusetts State Hospital. This is what people were put in for. Remember, you don't have diagnosis, schizophrenia or this. So these are all the reasons that you're put in there. Isn't that amazing? Just to read some of those. Disappointed ambition. Religiosity, what? intemperance, abuse of snuff and tobacco. Here's for the Pennsylvania Hospital, 1841. Take a look at this. Dread of poverty, intense study. You professors, you better watch it. You're going to drive some of your students <laughs> nuts. Grief, loss of friends, fright at fires, use of opium. You said tobacco. <laughs> Mental anxiety. And, lest you think it's the United States, this is when I was able to find a mission to the Aberdeen Lunic Saint Asylum in Scotland and look at the different things that they had for their reasons for admission. I just think it's fascinating. Death of relatives, religious excitement, family, dissension. Sedentary life. Drinks to the head. Some cancer of the breast. Old age. They didn't want to put you in there. Original imbecility. These are the people that, that had developmental problems. That was then, but what was it like in the mid 20th century? This is a picture from a Siberian insane asylum in the 40s and 50s. This is the conditions that are over there. However, this is Ohio, state of Santa Sign in the state of Ohio. What about mental retardation? Well, 1905, Alfred Bernay invented the IQ testing, and uh, he said, abnormal children can be educated. Isn't that interesting? That's the first thing. Though people may have low IQs, they can still learn. However, 1910, the psychologists corrupted the goal. They had this mental testing industry. They said it's hereditary, measured and labeled, and institutionalized. And they were also considered a menace to society. They used a moron, imbecile, idiot scale. So by the 1900s, there were 328 institutions, 200,000 people labeled mentally impaired. Well, that's how we treated our mentally impaired folks. Now we don't use the term moron, imbecile, or idiot, but we say moderate, severe, or profound. 
These are kids. This is how they were warehoused. <coughs> this is 1961. A little girl in Spain who's obviously got to a lot of problems. More women than men insane. This is interesting for you women here. In the mid to late 1800s, women were expected to behave according to society's expectations. Out to this archetype of the obedient housewife and mother. Um, so they were expected to be dutiful, submissive housewives, stay at home, blah, blah, take care of the children. But if a woman, well, okay, it was the man who made all the decisions in accordance with the archetype expected to do this. So divorce rates weren't very high. So women behave a way that opposed the views by her husband. The husband would then declare she was insane, have her sent to an insane asylum rather than going through a divorce. All that money and hassle, as the majority of couples would do today. And so many, many women were put in the insane asylum by their husbands who paid the judges to say that she was insane. I love this one for treatment. I found this one. Down at the bottom. It's called the Keyboard Cats. The piano was designed to raise the spirits. You know, it depressed the Italian prince who was too stressed out. So the musician would select cats whose voices were at different pitches then arrange them in the pens accordingly. The piano delivered his sharp pokes on the tails of the cats when you pushed the key. I'm not making this up, folks. How would you like to have a... The first music therapy that we had. <laughs> so, mental illness classified. So, the first classification was by Emil Kraepelin. And he was a German psychiatrist, considered the founder of medical psychiatry. I don't know why this crap's coming on here, but I'll try to ignore it. Book, 1899, Dementia, Precox, and Paraphrenia. Dementia precox means early dementia. Basically, it's schizophrenia. He studied schizophrenia and manic depressive insanity. So, he was the first one that formally classified diseases. And he said mental illnesses were virtually identical with psychotic behaviors. Psychotic. So, the first official nosology was published in 1918. 22 categories of diseases. And of those, 21, the people were psychosis. The diseases also, he said, they're exogenous or endogenous. Means they come from within, and you're going to do much or they come from without. And they come from without, that's kind of different. You see the etiology? And the ones that come from within, they don't have very good prognosis. And that won't get better. So, this is our spectrum of human behavior. It's all black, but we know different grades here. So what's normal and what's normal, very normal, and abnormal? Where do you draw the line? So what's, what's crazy and what's not? Well, he drew the line, psychotic and normal. So if you have these conditions, these 21 conditions, Schizophrenia, severe paranoid schizophrenia. Usually these people are seeing delusions, hallucinations, no contact with reality. Now, another new paradigm emerges at the turn of the century. Sigmund Freud. First, one of the books I read by him, Interpretation of Dreams. Fascinating. Interpretation of Dreams is the royal road to a knowledge of the unconscious activities of the mind. So in dream analysis, was one of the first ways that the therapist can get inside your brain. And then he wrote the classic text, Psychoanalytic Theory. And as most of you know, his contribution is, yeah, we all here, up here, conscious, but he says, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you're not aware of. Pre-conscious, you can go back to some memories, but then there's stuff way down here that you don't understand. This is repressed memories of your childhood, of things that happened to you, that, or you don't want to remember, or you can't remember. And libido energy is driving this. So this is his model. This is his paradigm. He also uses terminology of the ego. That's yourself. That's conscious. Superego. That's your 
conscience sitting on your shoulder. You should do that. You shouldn't do that. That's your moral guardian. And unconscious, you got this id down here. It's all your drives. You, know, you want this. You want that. You want sex. You, these are your desires. But you, they're down under, underneath there. You just keep those at bay. Of course, he talks about the different stages that sexually that you go through. The oral, anal, phallic, whatever. In psychosis versus neurosis, this is all the crapelin things. But neurosis, you have anxiety disorder, this is schizophrenia. Post-traumatic stress. Loses contact with reality. But in neurosis, you retain contact with reality. This begins with a stressor. Some of you say the stress causes mental illness. It does neurosis. But over here, not necessarily. Hallucinations and delusions, nope. Over here, not normal behavior, exaggerated behavior. Treated mainly by physical methods. Treated mainly by psychological. So see now, he, Freud is making a dichotomy between mental illness. And the genetic factors we talked about, really important in these, eh, not so much here. We'll go over that in detail. Stressful life events. Eh, I disagree with this slide, what he said right here, by the way. Uh, judgment, impaired, intact. Drugs, major tranquilizers. These drugs, minor tranquilizers. Valium, uh, Lubium, Lorazepam, major tranquilizers, Thorazine. ECT, very useful, not useful. Prognosis, bad. Prognosis, good. <laughs> well, we talked about transference, neuroses, and conflicts with the egos and the id. He also brought in the idea of defense mechanisms, which I think are very interesting. That defense mechanisms have two properties. It denies or distorts reality in some way, but it operates at an unconscious level to protect against anxiety and tries to safeguard the mind against feelings and thoughts that are too difficult for the conscious mind to cope with. So, you're all familiar with these. When I taught school and taught health science, I had my class memorize all these and give examples of them. When are you using repression? When are you using projection? Blaming somebody else for something that you really do. Regression, sublimation, changing your these libido drives into great art or music. So, I think this is a, a, a really, this has been thrown out uh, in modern psychiatry, but there's, there's some good stuff here. Well, gee, what's on a man's mind? Oh, boy. Oh, man, Oedipus complex. Just a case of mind over Mater. Oh. Yeah, remember you women were all blamed for a lot of stuff. Your mama caught you, did you? Even your pets could get a little therapy. <laughs> well, now you know why your dog or cat drinks so much. A couple good quotes, and then we'll have a break. Most people do not really want freedom, because freedom involves responsibility. Most people are frightened of responsibility. When I read that, I thought about it and filed that away, and there's a lot more truth in there than you would think. Yes, yeah. And this one, I like it. <laughs> Time spent with cats is never wasted. <laughs> so with that, let's take a little break and then we'll read to me. <laughs> Thank you all for taking your seats so, so quickly. And now we will turn it back over to JR. Thank you. Can you still hear me in the back? Lights okay? All right, well, fasten your seatbelts. We're just getting warmed up, folks. <laughs> so, Freud's paradigm. Remember, paradigm. We talk about these big scientific theories. Of his paradigm is the psychodynamic. The cause is what you're thinking and what happened to you. It's in your brain. He narrowed the gap between neurotic and normal behavior. Neurosis stem from universal childhood experiences that we've all had. The difference in outcomes varies only in expression, but not the cause. Ordinary experiences in childhood masturbation, for example, could later manifest in a variety of adult addictions, such as smoking, drug addiction, compulsive gambling, but, gambling, but also in great artistic expression. So now, what does the model look like? 
So we had psychotic, and now we, in between here we have neurotic. And then they're still normal, so if you're not neurotic, you're not psychotic, you're normal. But where is this line? Uh, you know, where, aren't, we all, aren't we all a little crazy? Aren't we all a little neurotic, maybe? So that's why I put the squiggles in here. So saying, oh yeah, I'm completely normal, and everyone else is, yeah, I don't know. I'm not buying it. So now the scope of psychiatry was greatly expanded to include a much wider range of behavior and thoughts. Psychiatrists moved from the asylums. If you wanted to be a, a, a psychiatrist, where did you work? In the same asylums. You didn't have a private office. So now you move to an office. Many more practitioners were needed to meet the increasing demand. Motivation causes of human behavior lie locked inside their mind and childhood experiences. Now mental health providers dealt more with people's personal problems, their unhappiness, deviant behavior, and less with serious mental diseases and psychosis. I want to repeat that. So all of us have personal problems. We all have unhappinesses. We all have behaviors that may be not completely normal. This is the whole purview now of psychoanalysis. Does psychotherapy work? Good question. We're going to come back to that in class four or five, or four, when we do the uh, treatment. It's not hard. So we'll find out. Does it work? The model. Doctor, patient, disease. This is what I've used in other classes, and I think it's, it's my paradigm that I think is really important. So now, the relationship is the key. Here's the patient, here's the doctor. The doctor and the patient form a bond. They get together for hours on end at a time. The patient gets to trust the doctor, the doctor gets to trust and know the patient. There's that therapeutic bond, right? That's what psychoanalysis is. And the stronger the bond, you can't do it without it. You can't give them a pill or do this or the doctor just pontificating from on high and say, we ought to do this, you ought to do that. No, it's an equal. Likewise, what do they think about the disease? They have the same model or paradigm. The patient thinks of the disease the same way as the doctor does. There's some screwed up stuff that happened to you in the past. It's affecting you now. And if we fix that, we can fix you. But both the patient and the doctor got to buy into that. And the disease cause, it's not supernatural, it's not kind of body function or anything like that, issues and unresolved conflicts in the subconscious mind. So that's the paradigm of analytic treatment. Who are the doctors and who are the patients? Uh, you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. How many people in here have had serious psychoanalysis? <laughs> okay. Where do most people think of a stereotype be sitting down with a psychiatrist every week for years and years and years? Where? Hollywood. Hollywood, maybe? More than that. Circus. No, think New York City. Yes. Yeah. New York City. Where most psychiatrists work are. Who are the people? Usually rich, for that white, often Jewish. That was the clientele. The psychiatrists come out here and set up, I'm going to do psychotherapy in the middle of Iowa, going to get a lot of farmers to come in? No, I don't think so. Why not? The paradigm for the farmer is, I mean, yeah, he's going to go broke. So it was an urban city, so you need to see the demographics of where this stuff is going on. But the things that he said, and Freud, those are everybody. So if you're depressed, and several years in psychotherapy wasn't getting better, what were your options for medical therapy? So you go, man, I don't want to do the psychotherapy stuff, or right, it's not around, what else could I do? Well, what well, Prozac? Uh, wait a minute, Prozac wasn't discovered until 92. And it didn't go into medical use until 86. Oh, are you depressed? You suffer from anxiety and migraine. Maybe you need a lobotomy. Oh, it only takes 10 minutes. Lobotomy specialist. 
Walter Freeman, MD. This was an ad that you see in a magazine or a psychiatric thing, just like you would for Prozac. Go get you in the bottom. So, psychiatrists inflicted brain damage with a lobotomy. You take a hammer, you get it basically an ice pick, you give somebody an electroshock that puts them in a seizure and knocks them out, you take an ice pick and it's about that long and you drive it up right under their eyeball, up into the brain and you wiggle it around and you cut all the fibers that go from the prefrontal cortex to the limbic system in the back. And you just kind of do that on one side and then you ram it one in the other eye and do that. So, what can you treat? You can treat schizophrenia, you can treat depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, extreme anxiety, and normal aggression. You can treat all these things with this therapy. Isn't that cool? Oh, side effects, death, <laughs> serious personality changes, become a zombie, epileptic fits. So it does have some side effects. So, you're a kid and Gee, you got some issues. 1966, fortunately I just got out of high school. Being unbelievably defiant, objects going to bed and daydreaming and said, I don't know, to a lot of questions that a dumb ask him. So he's the first, he's the youngest, 12 year, gets a frontal lobotomy. Walter Freeman, he traveled around the United States in a lobotomy mobile. He did up the that's just wrong, 2,500, 3,500 in 10 minutes in 23 states during that time period. Anyone here get a lobotomy? Probably not. Most famous lobotomized person is on the extreme right. Right. Recognize the Kennedy clan? Jack, Ted, Robert. There's Rose. So this is the procedure. This is Dr. Freeman doing it. So Rose Kennedy, before she lobotomized. She's 23, her father sought the lobotomy to cure what he called moodiness, fits of irritability and rebelliousness. He might also have been afraid she might embarrass the family by becoming pregnant and wedlock be one of her many escapes from the convent where she was being educated and cared for. After the lobotomy, Rosemary was reduced to an infantile state and needed constant care. Don't want to embarrass your family? Give your kids a lobotomy and ship them off to Wisconsin uh, in a convent for the rest of her life. Dad never visited her. Mom, I think, did once. And Eunice, the sister, founded the Special Olympics. Here's the lobotomy. Lobotomy. Heal. Now, you say, this is horrible. The founder, Igas Monitz, received the Nobel Prize for this. The highest prize in the world was given for the inventor of this procedure. Is are we in the dark ages? Are we in the medieval times? This is what we are doing. And by the way, Sweden thought this is a good experience. We think of Sweden being very, Sweden, very civilized country. They perform more lobotomies per capita than the United States. So it was a big fan worldwide. The Russians, however, in 1940 wrote a statement that said, this is a barbaric procedure and no one in, in the Russia will ever be allowed to have a lobotomy. So, a great paradigm shift occurred in psychiatry between 1950 and 80. We all lived through this, whether we knew this was going on. A lot of stuff happened in those years that we can all go back to. So, what were the factors that brought about a dramatic change? So, all of a sudden, psychiatry is going to go through these changes. So the changes in the medicine, new drugs, new category, categorizing it, political changes when the, within the American Psychiatric Association, cultural changes, social changes, the deinstitutionalizing of patients. Remember, got to get them all out of the medical ho uh, hospitals, insane asylums. Economic factors, Medicare, Medicaid, third-party insurance. All in big pharma, all these things came in to converge to totally paradigm change medicine. And these together resulted in a new and powerful paradigm. So the old model had significant limitations. It had poor reliability. They would take a, a videotape of a patient, 
show to American psychiatrists, send it over to Great Britain, show them the same videotape and have the doctors come up with a diagnosis and they'd be totally, totally different. So wait a minute, you've seen the same videotape. One says they're schizophrenic, no, they're bipolar. I mean huge difference, so not reliable. There was a drive for better research. How are you going to do research on the id? <laughs> not very good. You know, what, what can you measure? It, it just doesn't work. More emphasis on the biomedical model, discovery of new drugs. Ah, we can measure drugs. We'll see if these people get better. They have less hallucinations. That's something we can quantify scientifically measure. Uh, control of the APA was changing toward more academic research positions. The psychoanalysis were in charge at the top level. Then in St. Louis, a group, Fainer, they were doing a lot of, they were research scientists. They were doing all these experiments in, in labs, and they wanted to research. They got control of the upper echelon of the American Psychiatric Association. So political power within the AEPA also changed this. And the new model now, they call it Neo Franklin. Remember he said they're biologic, you're kind of born with that, it's genetics. Gee, they're saying, oh, now, biomedical model. Assumes that brain diseases are similar to diseases of other organs. It's like hepatitis, it's like all these other things. We'll, we'll define it and we'll study it and we'll, we'll figure out what's going on. Finally, the basic classification system had to change in a dramatic way, which we'll get to in a minute. So drugs take the stage. The discovery of the antipsychotics, especially Thorazine, revolutionized mental health hospitals. Thorazine for schizophrenia, lithium for bipolar, and antidepressants for depression. Antidepressants such as the MEO inhibitors, the tricyclics, later Celexa in Europe, and Prozac here in the U.S. started the pharmaceutical revolution, which is only accelerated. And we'll be talking a lot about that. Currently, the medical treatment of depression is based on the neurotransmitter theory of disease. One of the questions I was going to ask all of you in here is, think about it and tell me what causes depression. And I bet the majority of you would have said, oh, it's, it's a chemical process in the brain, or something screwed up with your chemicals, because you've all bought into that model. So Thorazine. These are for the psychotic. These are for the loony people. They're going nuts. You give them Thorazine, either shot or tablets, and, or long acting, they're better. So, this is a book I had on my bookshelf. Uh, for again, I were practicing in 96. Uh, gee, Psychopharmacology of Antidepressants. So, the current paradigm mono mean hypothesis of depression. For over 30 years, but this was in 96, so that's why I put 50 years. The leading theory to explain the biologic basis of depression has been the monomine hypothesis. It poses depression due to deficiency in one or another of the three biologic amines, namely serotonin or epinephrine, adrenaline, or dopamine. That's, that's the current paradigm that is floating out there, folks. Variations of it. It has to do with these transmitters and in the synapses and that's how the drugs up there work, and whatever. And over the years, the last 20 years, we found out, look at all these receptors. It isn't just one drug. We just thought, oh, it's serotonin. Oh, no, these are all different kinds of serotonin. Location in the stomach, and like, whoa, that's weird. Model by a woman down here at University of Iowa, Nancy Andreessen, wrote this book in the 90s, Broken Brain. And it summarizes what the paradigm is, right? That's, that's what's going on. you got a broken brain. Revolution in psychiatry. So the APA publishes its first classification of mental illnesses. There had been an international classification of diseases called the ICD, which started in 1893 just as a death registry by the WHO. So 1952, here comes the first manual. That's what it looks like. That's... that's Version one of this. So people say it's a lot thinner than this. So, heavily influenced by the work of Meyer, mental disorders were nothing more than a reaction to social stress and a failure to adapt to social norms. In other words, 
reaction of the personality to psychological, social, and biologic factors. Wow, I put a star by that. 52. That's what they thought caused most mental illnesses. So it's your reaction to all the crap that's going on in your life. Psychological, social, biological things. Well, then in 1968, they had another revision. Now this one has 182 disorders or diseases. This had 106. Similar framework. But it lacks specification. You couldn't figure out disturbances, talk about neuroses. And then this is the change, 1980s, a big star. 1980, everything changed in psychiatry. DSM-3 was a paradigm shift. Now they have diagnostic categories, linked them to specific symptom clusters in colloquial language. Now they're up to 265 diagnoses. And then the second revision, 292. And then DSM-4, 94, 900, 297 disorders. So, right here, things change. Now, it's a list of symptoms. And I'll give you some examples. So now, you can have a checklist of symptoms. As you check them symptoms, you got that disease. You look at them symptoms, you don't have that disease. You don't do anything else. So, see how things are changing. First of all, I put all these diseases in. Well, wait, where do these diseases come from? Who, who, who made those pigeonholes? The APA made those pigeonholes. So, this is the definition. Social cultural forces for change. 68 starts, 60s, remember? Us baby boomers. Anti-psychiatry movement starts. Thomas, can't pronounce his name, <laughs> talked about psychiatry that is just moral myths. I'm going to talk about some books. Behavioralist, challenge psychiatry. No, it's how you behave. Gay rights activism, criticized homosexuality, as some of you caught up, as a mental disease. It's up there in the book on, you know, it's a mental disease. So, is it a disease? It is in DSM-2. What causes it? Well, in the Freudian thing, what kind of cause it? Some problems with your mom, right? Your mother and father. I mean, you don't know, you know the theories of of a uh, woman, weak father, blah blah blah. How to treat it? If it's a disease. Shouldn't you treat it? Of course. How do you treat it? 1971 APA convention it was in San Francisco. Wow. Oh. Oh. Gee, what are people going around outside? So they had some people. Therapist and saying, like, look, get this out of here is a disease. And so they said, well, we better talk about this homosexuality stuff. So at our next convention, National Convention of Washington, D.C., we'll have a little panel discussion on that. So, first of all, back in the 70s, they came to a head when the gays invaded these meetings and came right up because they were using aversion therapy now to get people out of uh, their sexual preference. So they came up and they took the microphone from the head guy up there and said, this is wrong, you, can, you just mad visualize that happening. He said, talk about, stop talking about us and start talking with us. So they said, well, that's why the next meeting they said, we'll have a, a panel of gay people, including Frank Kameni, which was a major gay rights person then. And they also talk about the lifestyles of non-patient homosexuals. And, but they want to get a doctor on the panel who is gay. Well, you think there are any gay doctors in this country? <laughs> Psychiatrists? Of course not. But how are you going to get a gay doctor to get up in front of the panel of his cult and say, gayness is good? What do you think is going to happen to your job when you get back home and that convention's over? <laughs> I'm serious. So, <laughs> panel of psychiatry discuss homosexuality, psychiatry, friend or foe to homosexuals, a dialogue. Dr. Anonymous, <laughs> on the right, is John E. Fire. He had to wear a mask, you know? People didn't know who he was. That's the only way he could talk to make his presentation. And he gave such a powerful speech that 
Guess what? They declared no longer a mental illness. They had a meeting of the board of directors after this and said, oh, take that page out of here. Homosexuality is not a disease. But the membership was ticked off because a lot of them said, well, hey, oh, not so fast. We want to vote. So the 10,000 members of the APA said, we want to vote. Thumbs up or thumbs down. So they had a vote. 10,000 members of the psychiatrist. And they sustained this by 58%. So that's how, gee, all of a sudden, homosexuality is not a disease. Quote, the A American Psychological Association also. And therefore, it doesn't need a cure. So it was removed from the International Code of Diseases, which is a different system, not until 1990. That's when the rest of the world, the World Health Organization said, well, maybe we ought to get that out, and maybe it's really not a disease. A lot of books were coming out at this time. Myth of Mental Illness, Psychiatry, The Science of Lies, he likened psychiatrists to ministers and best to jailers at worst. <laughs> Not very favorable. Asylums, essays on the social situation of mental patients and other inmates. How many of you saw this movie? Linda and I are going to see it tonight. Susan has seen it, I have. Classic. Look at the hell in the snake pit. That's a homework assignment if you choose to get it on Netflix. Love it. Uh, it's a book that she wrote herself about her experiences. She was an American novelist, born in Indiana, and one of her books was this, her experiences while hospitalized at Rockland State Hospital in New York. 1946 was the book and the movie in 1948. Pretty powerful. I wrote this book. Ken Hesse, classic, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You can't believe how much social Forces change from books and or movies. They really do. You see what Dorothy, Dorothea Dix did as a person? Well, this book and the movie more so. One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest with, of course, our favorite Jack Nicholson. And yeah, remember, this Chief Brandon, our narrators, an inmate at the same asylum. They have to deal with this rebellious Murphy. Now, why does he go in there? He's not crazy. He wants, wants to get out of work detail in prison. You know, he, he's arrested, and they say, well, you going to the work farm here in the prison. He says, no, I'm crazy, man. You know, I'm crazy. So he's got to feign craziness to be able to get in the mental hospital because it's a lot easier than going out and working on that chain game. So he gets in, but then bad things, well. First film in 42 years sweeps all major Academy Awards. Best movie, best actor, best actress, best director, best screenplay. Powerful, powerful. And, of course, at the end, this is what they do to who was formerly the same person. Another thing, 1946, Life magazine, photo essay, exposed the abuses at American mental hospitals. They went to Byberry State in Philadelphia and Cleveland State. There's about 800,000 inmates in the United States hospitals at that time, and there's 180 state hospitals. So it's called Bedlam. Gee, where did that name come from? Bedlam back in yeah. St. Asylum. And so he's calling this article Bedlam in 1946. So look at the pictures here. Neglect. Restraint. Nakedness. Overcrowding. Forced labor and rights of our allies. Besides the beatings. Etc. So this is what we're doing in the 40s to our mentally people. Not what they did back hundreds of years ago. This is us in our state hospitals now in the 40s. So when people saw this and they saw one flew over the cuckoo's nest, obviously you respect the uh, uprising. In the following decade, effective medications, particularly the antipsychotics, help treat or ameliorate many of the patients. So yes, yeah, some of them you could give them drugs and have them leave the hospitals. And politically, they developed a strong imperative to get rid of the problem rather than effectively deal with it. So what do we do, folks? 
let's just close the mental hospitals. Let's just put everybody out and get them out of here. Then we don't have to worry about them. There's not crap like this. We just, we just try to put them out. Put them out on the street, which we did. So you look at the curve of all the state mental hospitals in the United States, down, 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 down. As a consequence of the next 20 or 30 years, states dramatically discharged their wards in the communities with the rationale that they were ready. They're ready, but in actuality, it was to decrease state expenditures. Sound familiar? The deinstitutionalization or ising of hundreds of thousands of needy patients would, of course, create many unforeseen and many unforeseen consequences. Problems. Now, psychiatrists and psychotherapists were ill-equipped to deal with these patients who are now on the outside, requiring a myriad of social, economic, and non-analytic psychological needs to function in society. So you're a psychiatrist. Are these people got any money to pay? Are you going to help them? You better start changing your profession or do something different. Oh, all these drugs just come up. Maybe I'm going to get out of the psychotherapy business and be a different kind of psychiatrist. What about the sexual revolution? Have then a better birth control? Disregard of any of the sexual mores? Well, what did that do to the Freudian foundations of repressed sexuality? Because that was one of the drivers of a lot of his theories, is we got all this repressed sexual stuff, and now we go, hey man, <laughs> let it happen. I don't need a psychotherapist, you know, to talk about that. And starting with the findings of Kinsey and Masters and Johnson, open discussion, scientific studies brought sexuality out of the closet and at the same time out of the subconscious. More importantly, economic factors always follow the money. Always. It will always lead you to the truth. Funds for research. If you have this different model, a disease model, now you get money for research. So all the hospitals, universities are doing research, but they're doing it on this biologic model. I need the medical schools. Government reimbursements, Medicare, Medicaid. You think they're going to pay for some psychotherapy for you for an hour every week for a bunch of time? I don't think so. Private insurance. So you have to have a diagnosis, you have to have a disease for public and private insurance to cover. And of course, drug companies, research and sales, money, what happens to the pharmaceutical industry? Not just Thorazine and stuff, developing Prozac and Viagra, and billions and hundreds and billions and billions. Direct marketing of drugs to the public and doctors. Big factor. That's why a lot of you are buying into this paradigm. And that's why many of us doctors did also. Oh, your patient's got depression. We got these six drugs, doc. Here's some samples of them. Oh, that didn't work here. Try this. So we're all being sucked into the paradigm shift. So, DSM-3, combination, 1980. Now diagnoses are totally based on symptoms. <coughs> So, we talked about that. So, here's schizophrenia. So, how do you diagnose schizophrenia? Well, characteristic symptoms. Two or more of the following, each present for a significant portion of time during a one month period or less, if it's successfully treated. Gee, do they have delusions? Do they have hallucinations? Disorganized speech? Grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior, that's where you're kind of like negative symptoms, just affective flattening. So you can just check some of those things off and go, chick, 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 we got schizophrenia. You don't have to do any tests or anything else. For a while, they came up with this multi axis system, the DSM 4. They said, well, also, why don't you see if there's any personality disorders or memory retardation? Why and see if they got cancer or something else they could explain this? Um, why are they going to whack over? Maybe they're alcoholic. Gee, that's why they're acting crazy. What are the social stressors? And how's their overall functioning from zero to 100? How are they just doing life? Pretty neat that they actually had that. But then in DSM-5, eh, that's a bother to take that out. <laughs> Back to the biologic model. So this one, 
This isn't the real one, because the real one's 947 pages. In 2013. So, in the United States, it serves as a universal authority for psychiatric diagnosis. Treatment recommendations, as well as payment by providers. So if I see any of you for any, any quote, diseases, I've got to come up with either a system in this or in the international ICD-10 code. <laughs> Gee, Lucy's already on the ball. She is ready. I can see what the next cartoon shows on that one. <laughs> so, codes begin. Everything's about coding now. So before September of 16, you had the codes on the left and then on the right for all these disorders, hoarding disorder, F42, but then they say, no, it's got to be a decimal point, point three in it, obsessive compulsive. So they got all these numbers, and we got to do that or forget sending any money reimbursement insurance stuff. So we got to put you in picture home, and we're going to get paid. Mm -hmm. Thus, new diagnostic biomedical model has nearly completely taken over not only psychiatry, but also much of the present culture, not only in America, but in much of the world. Not just the United States, folks. This is paradigm all over. So what's happened? Doctor, patient, disease. Well, the doctor, he's, he doesn't have to be, why do you need an MD? Freud even said, you don't need to be an MD doctor to do psychoanalysis. So he, he wasn't just trying to protect the MD profession of psychiatrists. But now, you don't have to be a doctor, healthcare provider. As long as you can write scripts. What's the disease? Well, you know, just get a list of symptoms. Just check, check off. Patient. Where's the etiology of diseases? Is it supernatural? Nope. Is it what you're thinking about? Nope. Is it about your childhood experience? Nope. It's a problem in the brain. Your brain, that's what's screwed up. And specifically, your transmitters are screwed up. And so that's, you see the model? That's the model. Today, I'm not saying everybody, but that is the current paradigm that we're under. So, what's the problem? Well, I told you. So, we just talked about this relationship is really different. Oh, let's go back. Uh, go back one. Does the doctor and the patient have to have any relationship for me to prescribe you your well butrin? No, oh, no. Come in. You know, we don't have that relationship. We don't talk. I can. How many patients can I see in an hour that way? First is spending an hour with you doing some psychotherapy. Chink, 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 chink. Yeah, I mean, you got to think of this in other ways, too. But what is the medical system that we're involved in? I just told you, part of it, what it covers and what it doesn't cover. Now, what about this whole thing out here? Social system and culture. We're not talking about that, are we? We're going to. Because one of my hypotheses, you'll find out, is that besides this paradigm not being a good one and being wrong, this is where the action is, folks. The social system and the culture. The aim and the chemicals in your brain. It is to a degree. I'm not a nihilist when it comes to, to medication. But I'm telling you, and I'll show you, and I'll show you diseases next time. That, that are created by the medical system in, in, in the populace. So, class two will attempt to show why and how the current paradigm of mental illness is inadequate. Not only for diagnosis, to put you in one of these 450 boxes, but also for treatment. Because if it's a good paradigm, it should predict and help treat. The reason Newtonian physics went down the hill is they didn't predict stuff very well. Einstein's theory of relativity predicted lots of stuff that took 10, 20, 50, 80 years to then prove. But it predicted stuff. And everything has come up true. This model predicts stuff, but we'll find out it doesn't work. Explain why there's such an increase in mental illness and people needing treatment. Why is the United States so high in the world? We've got to answer that question next time. And I'll make the case for a hybrid system that emphasizes a sociologic approach over the biologic, medicalized one that we use today. So, homework, 
You can see one flew over the cuckoo's nest, a uh, snake pit, three faces of Eve or Sybil, because we're going to talk about multiple personality disorder next time too. Uh, in the next homework assignment, next week will be tougher, but I thought I'd, I'd just have you do one fun again here. Uh, so I'm going to read the 301.81. We're going to talk about Narcissistic Personality Disorder. <laughs> so your homework assignment, if you choose to accept it, is to, I'm going to read you the criteria, and don't talk to other people, don't use patient names, you can use initials, but, <laughs> but see if you can find somebody in your life that maybe has a Narcissistic Personality Disorder. Okay, so, this is the definition. From the Bible, you know, I'm a preacher up here at the pulpit. A pervasive pattern of grand, grandiosity in fantasy or behavior, the need for admiration and lack of empathy, beginning in early adulthood and present in a variety of contexts, as indicated by five or more of the following. So this is a, a whole thing. It starts in kidhood. So, got to get five, but I'm going to read you nine. One has a grandiose sense of self-importance. That is, exaggerates achievements and talents. He expects to be recognized as a superior without commensurate achievements. That's number one. Number two, is preoccupied with fantasies of unlimited success, power, brilliance, beauty, or ideal love. Two, believes he or she is, quote, special, end of quote. And unique, it can only be understood by or should associate with, with other special or high status people. Four, requires excessive admiration. Five, has a sense of entitlement. That is, unreasonable expectations of especially favorable treatment or automatic compliance with his or her expectations. Six, is intrapersonally exploitive. That is, takes advantage of others to achieve his or her own ends. Seven, lacks empathy. Is unwilling to recognize or identify with the feelings and needs of others. Eight, is often envious of others or believes that others are envious of him or her. Nine, shows arrogant, haughty behaviors or attitudes. So, your assignment is see if you can, if anybody out there that you can ever think of that would have at least five of those characteristics, and don't use names next time, we will ask if you're able to find anybody with person, you can diagnose yourself, see, you don't need to be a psychiatrist to diagnose this stuff, right? We'll talk about treatment later. A spoiler alert, personality disorders is Dr. Ferguson, and I know, don't do well. That's why we call it personal episode. So thank you for your time and attention, and we'll join next week. Join next week. Thank you, everyone, for coming today. Remember, before you leave, to turn off your cheek foils and turn on your cell phones, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. I'm going to do that right away. I'm going to turn on my cell phone.